Chapter 9. Perpetual Traveling In the panarchistic sense, governments around the world compete with each other for tax cattle. They'll offer different incentives, tax breaks, and additional privileges, such as marijuana decriminalization or gun ownership, to convince individuals to relocate to their jurisdiction. Sure, the ideal situation would be no affiliation with the world's most successful mass murderer known as government, but again, Vanu is based on reality, not on how we, as Vanuans, wish things to be. That's the prerogative of the political crusaders. As Rayo said, become internationally mobile. Stop being a captive audience for the real-life black comedies of a particular gang of clowns turned goons and begin making real market choices between states. It is true that van nomadism and minimalist sailboating, generally speaking, are methods of perpetual traveling, but it's worth expanding upon the subject further. There are a couple of different applications to examine, but we should cover a few preliminary notes first. Residential taxation, territorial taxation, and the five flag theory. Residential taxation is a bitch, and it's a major reason why many expats rescind their United States citizenship. Reason being, the IRS claims taxes on any money you make, regardless of whether it is in Spain, Antarctica, Mars, or anywhere else in the Milky Way galaxy. Territorial taxation, on the other hand, means that you only owe your government of residence income tax if you make money inside their jurisdiction. So what is the five flag theory? It's a way for an individual to not be considered a legal resident of any of the countries they spend time in or operate in, and therefore is a way to avoid the legal obligations that come with it. The flags are as follows. 1. Passport and citizenship in a country that does not tax money earned outside of the country or attempt to control actions outside of its jurisdiction. 2. Legal residence in a tax haven. 3. Business base where one earns money ideally somewhere with low corporate tax rates. 4. Asset haven where one keeps their money ideally somewhere with low taxation of passive income and capital gains. 5. Playgrounds where one spends money, ideally somewhere with low consumption taxes. This is the most popular strategy perpetual travelers use. Let's take a look at a couple of case studies to see how this lifestyle could be developed. Case Study Victor the Vagabond Victor Cruz was born in Canada in the mid-70s. He worked as a developer in the technology realm for 20 years until the boom of the internet. He started a couple online businesses and made a bunch of money in short order. He'd always wanted to live a life of travel, but had never possessed the funds to do so. Now, he could. Victor sold his home and all of his belongings, sans what he could fit into a suitcase. He did some research into what countries he might like to utilize for the five flag theory and got his new legal affairs in order. He traveled around for a while, getting a feel for different countries to see where he would like to spend most of his time. He found that France, Ecuador, and Brazil were his absolute favorite places. But most countries only allow tourists to remain there for so long without applying for a tourist visa. Well, considering he's a perpetually traveling Vanuan, he always relocates before having to go through that process. He finds that he typically rents houses wherever he goes. Sure, he may not be building equity, but it beats the hell out of paying a ton of taxes each year. Since he flies everywhere, he does have a few run-ins a year with the airport bludgies. He dislikes the invasions of privacy and the coercion, but he feels it's a price worth paying to live the life that he truly wants to live. Case Study Winfred the Wanderer Winfred was your average individual in the Servile Society just a few years ago. He was stuck at a dead-end job in Wellington, New Zealand, making just enough money to survive. His rent was high and he felt trapped in a life that he couldn't even recognize anymore. His life wasn't even his own. Out of desperation, he began doing some research on the internet and stumbled across the van dwelling section on YouTube. He was enthralled with the lifestyle and decided that it was for him. So he saved up as much money as he could, bought a van, and converted it into a liveaboard rig. Since he was already living frugally out of necessity before, this change was quite smooth for him and allowed him to finally save a substantial amount of money. He lived in his van working the same job for a handful of years while building up his investment capital. He eventually had enough to break free. He quit his job, sold his van, and flew to America. For a few weeks, he stayed at an Airbnb in Austin, Texas, until he found a new van to buy and convert. He traveled across North America for about a year and decided it was time to move on again. So he sold the van and hopped onto a flight to Perth, Australia, only to repeat the process. When he was in Australia, he became enamored with a woman who lived aboard her boat, and she with him. They only spent a few weeks together, but they decided to set sail to circumnavigate the globe. It would turn out to be a five-year adventure, and they loved every minute of it. 
Now Winfred is free and he found another self-liberator in the process. He was willing to make the sacrifices necessary for a life of freedom. It wasn't easy, but nothing worthwhile in life really is. His case study is a great example of how Ivanowin can use van nomadism as an intermediate vehicle for self-liberation. Pun intended. Advantages and Disadvantages From the above case studies, you should be able to see some clear advantages as well as disadvantages. Let's start with the advantages. If you're a resident of a place you never spend time in, the politics at play are completely irrelevant. It'd be akin to caring about the politics of Italy after you've had a week-long vacation to Rome. Compared to your average news junkie, this opens up a lot of time for other pursuits. It'll probably save you some health care bills down the road, too, if you've made it this far in the book. Politics probably makes your blood boil. Perpetual travelers also have the ability to utilize legal intercises that aren't available to most stationary dwellers. They can organize their life in such a manner as to avoid most of the coercion of the servile society. Because, let's face it, the most coercion comes from the government presiding over your country of residence. One other advantage was elucidated by Rayo. He said, The mobile libertarian not only bypasses most existing state coercion, but is well equipped to escape incipient totalitarianism. With the American government readying plans for general forced labor, rationing and censorship in the event of war or other national emergency, escape can be essential for philosophical, if not physical, survival. And while a retreat in the boondocks can serve as a temporary hideout, when total fascist socialism comes, those who fare best are usually those who leave early. With the modern political climate and all this talk about a wall, I think Rayo's words are more important now than they ever were then. After all, government walls are not to keep people out. They're meant to keep people in. History has more than borne out this fact. In this event, perpetual travelers will already be ahead of the game, as there are really no sane reasons they would ever choose America as their country of residence. Unfortunately, there are some disadvantages, though. Most importantly would be this strategy's reliance upon slave tags. Only in this case, it's a passport, not necessarily a driver's license. As Rayo so astutely points out, get a passport, but don't depend on it. Passports may be revoked in the event of a national emergency. Earlier this year even, the American government revealed that they might suspend passports for seriously delinquent taxes, or more specifically, in excess of $50,000, including interest and penalties. Those can add up quick. What's scarier is the fact that passports may be needed at some point in the near future to even travel domestically. Talk about a great way to keep the tax cattle in the cage. Anyway, what does this mean for perpetual travelers? As I said above, I don't think any intelligent Vanuan perpetual traveler would ever choose America as their place of residence. It's counterintuitive to the entire notion of perpetually traveling. Furthermore, even if the individual in question took pleasure in paying taxes and didn't rescind their citizenship, it would be unwise to rely upon just an American passport. Imagine if you were in Costa Rica, about to board a plane and your passport was revoked for whatever reason, i.e. delinquent taxes, national emergency, whatever. I wouldn't want to be in that position. A solution to this problem is dual citizenship and having two different passports. But do your research and make sure most countries will accept it. For example, you probably wouldn't want to get a passport from Somalia or Afghanistan. That way, if one is revoked, you aren't shit out of luck in some foreign country. It's not a perfect solution, and proposing citizenship for two countries to Vanuans might be a tough sell, and rightfully so. Keep in mind, proper preparation prevents piss-poor performance. Try not to get stuck in Costa Rica, unless you want to, of course. Perpetual traveling is another interesting strategy for freedom pioneers, and again, it's all up to how you structure it. You could be Victor the Vagabond, Winfred the Wanderer, a combination of the two or something all of your own. Let's close out this section with some more timeless words from Rayo. So, the free man of the world, like the alert shopper who buys the specials at various stores, selects the best features of various states, and his very mobility gives added protection from the worst depredations.